this is for the benefit of those who are voting early, which is, of course, something you may do now requesting a ballot. Now, Susan Simpson, I'm ready to introduce you. <laughs> She's throwing things. Oh, welcome to the first of a series of forums on before the general election. I have my spiel about the ballots at the back of the room because there are the ballots that we will be voting in Albany County. They're double-sided and we stapled them up on one side so you can turn it over and you can see the ballot that you will be voting. If you don't know your ward and your precinct on the wall, we have copies of the ward maps and the precinct maps for Albany County. If you moved since May, when the county clerk's office sent out the cards with the information about your wards, your precincts, and your polling places, you will need to go to the county clerk's office and correct your registration. Question? Paul, oh, yes. here you are. Oh, okay. <laughs> The room is set up courtesy of some of the teens from YAC. One of the teens alphabetized all the name tags at the back of the room. We would ask you to put the chairs up at the end of the evening. And we thank County IT for helping us download the video that will be available on both the library and the League of Women Voters website. We have at the back of the room a um, flyer from the Wyoming Secretary of State talking about the election. We have a flyer that describes where you can go for additional information. The League of Women Voters U.S. has a website and our voter guide will be posted on the national website. So you can see it there and it's going to be on which boomerang? October 28th. October 28th boomerang. <coughs> if you moved since the last general election and if you didn't vote in the primary, you will also need to change your registration. The county clerk's office asks that you go online to the county clerk's webpage and put your address in and see what your polling place ought to be because of your brand new residence. Go there to register to vote because if you go to your old polling place, they will send you to your new polling place and it's frustrating. And the poll, I see a nod in the audience. Yes. There are new polling places this year, too. The Public Library, for instance, is not a polling place and the Lincoln Community Center is. And so it's a good idea to check if you're not sure where you should go to vote because you'll feel frustrated and upset if you go to the wrong place and get moved around. You can register and vote absentee until the day before the election. You can register. If you register or change your registration in any way 14 days before the election, you're going to have to vote that day. And I had a conversation with Rosemary London, London in the clerk's office, and she said it was confusing. And I can tell by looking at your faces that you're feeling confused. But you can go to the clerk's office or call them and get the information because your registration to vote is really important. And of course, you can vote on Election Day. And the Secretary of State's website describes what you need to provide identification for yourself to register to vote. There are evaluation forms at the back of the room. Please fill them out. It helps us know what publicity works best. And isn't the sound system terrific? This is courtesy of the Laramie Film Society and Robert Roten. Yay! It's better than one. So thank you very much. I think this is the best sound we've ever had. Candidates, be sure you're speaking into your mic directly. We are recording you. We will have you. We'll put it on Facebook. All right, when you're up, people can go and look at the recording. All right. I am pleased to introduce Judy Knight, who is co-president of the League of Women Voters of Laramie, Wyoming, and she is the moderator for this evening. Judy? And here's Paul. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Where's She's the, the lady with the tape. scotch tape, Thank you so, so that's why I couldn't hang you up, Paul, but... I'll get hung up later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Uh, the format tonight, as you can see, there are a lot of candidates here, and we have two major offices that are being voted on. Uh, hospital board, which is all candidates uh, to, I guess there are three of you? Is that all? Okay. Uh, and city council. So I'm going to entertain questions for both groups at the same time. And therefore, you in the audience should start scribbling down questions, because this is your night. You're the ones who ask the questions. I am, however, going to begin with asking anybody who's in the audience who is a candidate for another office, other than one that is on the forum tonight, to stand up and introduce yourself. And we have... Hi, I'm Matt Green. I'm running for re-election for House District 45. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. I would urge all candidates to come particularly to the forum that will be on the 25th of October at the Lincoln Community Center because that one is, the forum is for school board. But the school board race is not contested. There are exactly as many candidates as there are openings. So it's an excellent time for all other candidates to come and to take this opportunity to meet with citizens who may live on the west side. That's one of the reasons why we changed the location to the Lincoln Community Center for this last one. Okay, as Susan said, election day is Tuesday, November 6th, but you can start voting now. And so therefore, um, I'm going to begin here. I see that the runners have started bringing me questions. The format is going to be, you'll have 90 seconds to respond to a question. We have a crack timer here right in the front, Joe Carroll Rock, who is going to hold up signs that say you have 60 seconds, 30 seconds, and then stop. And we will give every candidate who wants to respond to a question an opportunity to do that, assuming that it's for your office. Now, perhaps some of the questions will be so general that hospital board people would like to respond, as well as um, the city council people. I, I could spend time introducing everybody here, but I think their signs are all correct, right? You're in the audience. You're, you're looking at them in a better angle than I am. So I don't think I'll do that. I'll just let you figure out who's speaking. Yes, Amy? If I might suggest, if you have a question, hold your arm up in the air with your piece of paper or your card in it so that I can see you. Then you don't have to go leaping over a row of people. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to try to read people's handwritings here. And the first question happens to be for the hospital board. So, you three, beginning with Trent. Hold your hand up, Trent, so we know everybody from Trent on down is for the hospital <coughs> board. Given the economic situation, do you think it was smart to invest $36.5 million to remodel the hospital? Trent, we'll begin with you. Okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody. Microphone? Do you have one Oh, there? I'm sorry. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and the League of Women Voters for putting this on. Um, as far as investing the money, I trust that there was a need. Uh, it is a heck of a lot of money. It does concern me in the light of um, Obamacare, or call it what you will, the Affordable Care Act. Um, that being said, um, it is done with cash which is nice to know, but um, I can't say that I'm necessarily comfortable spending that much money knowing what's coming down the pipeline with Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act. Okay, Tom? Uh, I guess if you're the hospital and you're making money, uh, Using that money to improve your facilities and keep up with the time is not a bad thing to do with your money. Uh, Health care is more and more complicated. It's more complex. It's going to take more room to do what the hospital needs to do. Uh, we can't live in the past. If, you, if you're standing still, uh, you're going backwards. Uh, 
I think it's a, a good thing that the hospital take the opportunity when they have an opportunity to grow. And growing the physical, physical plant is uh, one way to allow the hospital to grow on the inside also. And Rex. Well, as I understand it, the uh, expansion will, among other things, improve the in the residential facilities there for inpatient care, and I think that's really important. Um, I don't know for sure what the utilization of uh, inpatient rooms have been at the hospital, but I know this is going to improve the conditions considerably. And the, as, as Tom said, the cash is on hand, and I think it's a good use of the cash at this point. It's been generated by uh, cost savings and so forth over the last several years, and I'm sure that the previous board looked at this very carefully before deciding to go ahead and improving the facilities. And so I'm very much in support of that. Okay, thank you. Our next count is, uh, question is for City Council. We're going to begin with Paul Weaver. And the question is, do you think that there is a need for more open space and parks, especially in the Alta Vista Indian Hills area? If so, what should the City Council do to facilitate this Specifics, please. Paul, microphone, or I guess I can do this one. Let's get the microphone. There you go. Okay. Um, I also want to uh, give my thanks for all the hard work that goes into organizing these forums and to those of you who came tonight to listen to us. I think there is a need for more open space and uh, parks in Laramie. I think that's something that makes a community attractive. It makes a community more livable. It's uh, something that we all enjoy to be able to have those kinds of uh, recreational areas available to us. With respect to the question asking whether or not we need more in the Alta Vista Indian Hills area, I can only think of one park maybe two that are in that general area. There's the very small one that's in the Alta Vista area whose name escapes me right now, but I'm familiar with it. And uh, then there's, um, I think probably the next closest park is Harbin Park, unless you count that uh, kind of interesting runoff area that's over there by the junior high school, which I don't really think is much of a park. I don't see a lot of people using it. It seems more like a mosquito pit. But, um, I, I, so there you go, you've heard my answer. Yes, I do. As far as specifics, I think it's up to the city and uh, interested citizens, frankly, to try and keep uh, their radar out there for potential areas that could be developed for green space. And I think we've talked about that a lot in reference to a couple of uh, proposed developments over the last uh, couple of months here. But you run into a lot of questions about private property ownership and uh, how to move forward with those things in appropriate fashion. I know there's been some discussion about you, uh, the potential purchase of the area, of the uh, aquifer to be used, but no easy answers as of yet, but yes, I think we should have more park space. Excellent. Matthew? Matthew? Yes, I do believe there should be more parks, not just in the Alta Vista area, but in all of Laramie. I am a firm believer in parks making a city look more beautiful. This can attract people to the city. So yes, there should be more parks as far as the question of what should the city council do. That is just one of those things that would be put on the agenda and they'd have to discuss. There's not a solid concrete answer of what they should do to um, get the parks. They would have to get the money, get the space, the whole works. It's just something that would be put on the agenda to take care of at many of the meetings. I might say that all three of these are candidates for award one. And all four. All four. All four. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, I do believe that we should have more parks and more open space. And right now I'm serving on the Parks, Tree, and Recreation Master Plan Ad Hoc Committee. And we are actually drawing up a master plan for placement of parks. And I think that the Alta Vista and Indian Hills area is a good place for a park, especially over the aquifer. Maybe that could be a way to protect some of the aquifer there. Um, so yes, I believe we should definitely have more parks and open space. And Laramie is an especially active population, if, if I know. I've heard that statistic. 
I'm Eric Molvar, I'm a city councilman, and I'm running for, uh, I guess, re-election, but now in Ward 1, and I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters. Uh, certainly, uh, parks and open space are a real key to the quality of life for residents in a city like Laramie. We have a lot of uh, younger families associated with the university, and if we want to really have a lot more younger families in this town and have a kind of a blossoming of that sector of our economy that is based on having young urban professionals, I think we're going to need to have parks and open space. Certainly, the city has done a study and has identified the north end of Laramie and the east end of Laramie as areas that have fewer acres of parks per unit, uh, per unit population than are really needed. So we really do need to expand the parks in those areas. And we, we have identified that as a need, and now we need to go forward and do it. Finally, uh, in terms of the aquifer, uh, the city of Laramie has a tremendous opportunity here because the landowner, uh, Effie Warren Livestock, that owns the 13,000 acres above our aquifer recharge zone would like to sell that property to the city. And we would like to acquire that because that open space uh, over the aquifer would not only protect our water supply, but would provide an outstanding opportunity to have a real keystone park and open space asset for public recreation uh, that puts us on a par with the neighboring uh, communities, such as Fort Collins and Cheyenne, which already have large holdings that are open to public recreation. I think we need this in terms of attracting new businesses. We need this in, in terms of attracting new young professionals. And it's something that in the legislature we were this close to getting. The governor actually did put $15 million in the budget for the city of Laramie to acquire it. And we need to follow through on that. Could you pick up that microphone? Thank you. Also, I would like to thank the League of Women Voters, the Albany County Public Library, and all of you for coming to this forum tonight. Um, as was mentioned tonight, there has been a study it's been determined that there is a great need for parks in the east part of Laramie. We're very deficient. The good news is the director of Parks and Recreation, Paul Harrison, is very much interested in this. He is bringing proposals to the city for this. We have support currently from the staff and from the city council for us to develop <laughs> parks in this area, and not just you know small parks like Kiowa and, and parks that are not as accessible like Scout, but also to have something that's, that would be very um, substantial. So obviously, I support this. I think it's also important for us to look for ways to improve our green belt and our walking paths and bicycle paths also in this area, as well as to circle the entire city. a need for uh, parks and open spaces. And just to kind of keep this thing rolling, I'll just yeah. move on. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone for coming out this evening in order to listen to us uh, talk about some of our points of view up here. And uh, thanks for giving us the opportunity, uh, League of Women Voters, to do this because this is a very important part of our democratic process. Uh, currently, I, I sit on the city council. My name is Scott Mulder, and, and I also sit on the uh, Parks, Trees, Rec ad hoc committee that is uh, looking at our definite uh, lack of parks. We are over 50% underserved in this city uh, by national standards. And uh, one of the things that we're working on truly is trying to put together, we've done a public survey, and we're trying to identify those areas of the city that really are in need, and Indian Hills is one of those areas that really truly is in need. Everything north of uh, the uh, Reynolds Street up there in that eastern port portion of the city is very definitely in need uh, from 15th East. And, you know, recruitment is very important for both jobs and uh, employees. And one of the things we can do in this city to help businesses recruit is to provide parks, green space, trails because people find those recreational amenities very important. And I definitely support that and my activities on the committee. Um, I'm working towards doing that for this city. So thank you. Yeah. Well, hello. My name is Bill Brizuela. If my name tag is to askew, I would like to thank all the civic-minded people that, and the civic-minded people that made this event possible and populated. Thank you. When I was a kid, we'd walk towards the East Hills from Grace Gable and we were in open space. 
I mean, there is a lot of good times I've had in the areas outside of Laramie, but you can find, you can recreate, this is a town, there's beauty everywhere you look. I would support a park in this area, maybe if we could Xeriscape, have something with uh, less investment in, in water and other resources. I think it'd be a fine place to have it. And we can always enjoy the area outside of town, you just have to set foot outside. Uh, thank you. Joe? One of my favorite subjects. For 15 years in Michigan, I was a certified Parks and Recreation Director. I taught a couple of graduate classes at two major universities in Michigan on Park Recreation Administration. I designed parks. I wrote the grants for the parks. I built the parks. I wrote maintenance statements for the parks. I also assisted in putting together a 26-mile bike trail which the last link was put together last summer. And the last link went through under I-75 overpass and went through a wetlands out to the state park. And uh, so I had over 539 acres of parkland in a community of 30,000, not counting the other amenities that were along Lake Erie that we were on. I also fostered the conversation and initiated the process to establish the Park Tree Recreation Ad Hoc Committee, the Dua Master Plan. There are deficiency zones located in the north part of the community and the west part of the community. I think all of that will be identified. When we get the master plan, we can start looking at funding and putting the pieces together. Uh, so do I support Parks and Recreation? Yes, I was a certified professional in it for 15 years. I taught it, I lived it, and that, that's when you're really a part of the community. So. And I should have said that, starting with Joe, we have two candidates for Ward 3, and starting with Joe Shumway, we have four candidates for Ward 2. I apologize for not making that clear. So, Becky Riley, go ahead. Good evening, and thank you very much for coming out this evening. Um, I'm going to get a little more specific. Um, obviously, I think that we need um, a lot more parks in our area. I think the master plan that is currently being developed is very interesting. Um, I had the opportunity to sit in on, on a couple of the meetings, and um, that committee is working extremely hard. I think the key to this, though, especially in Ward 3, is the open space issue. Developed parks are not necessarily what this particular area, as citizenry, are interested in. They're more interested in an open space, and I'll just um, kind of go on with what Bill said. Not so much the developed um, grassland kind of, you know, process. They're interested more in connecting with the walking trails and Obviously, there's a great deal of private property up there. Um, the private property at this point in time um, has been platted to a certain extent. Um, the university owns a portion of it that connects with the, some of the trails on the back side over towards Grand. Um, specifically, I would like to see that reflected in the master plan and acquisition of those properties as soon as possible. Thank you. I'm assuming the hospital board candidates don't care to talk about open space. No. Oh, Tom does. Okay. You may. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was on the city council a dozen years ago, and for the person who asked the question, we had master plan studies done. We had park master plans done. Uh, the green belt that's down on the river was all part of that. But part of that master plan was a a green belt that went completely around Laramie, anywhere from 10 to 20 miles of green belt. If you go down to Fort Collins and look at their green belt, or Boulder, or all those green places downhill from us, their green belts, their bikeways, are parks. They connect little pieces here and there. They're wide enough to use for more than just walking and, and biking. Uh, so if you want to see a park somewhere, don't just let the city council say we're master planning it 
and expect it to happen. If you want it to happen, you have to hold somebody's feet to the fire. Okay? Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to combine three questions in one. And they are directed toward two people up here specifically, Scott Molnar and Trent Kaufman. The question revolves around conflict of interest. And I am, uh, for the benefit of our timekeeper, Joe Carroll, <laughs> I'm going to give those two people 90 seconds to respond to the question about whether you think it's appropriate for you as a member of a body that organizes and is responsible for public funds to have a vested interest in a business that comes before this body. Um, and then I will give everybody else on the counts, uh, among council candidates and hospital board candidates 30 seconds to give your two cents worth on conflict of interest. So we'll begin with you, Scott. All right. Thank you. Um, I, in a city the size of Laramie, this isn't a full-time job. Being a, a, a city council member is not a full-time job. We, uh, we are business people. Many of the people that sit on the council, more than half, are business owners in the city of Laramie. I own, I own businesses in the city of Laramie. And uh, by volunteering for the council, by putting myself forward for election, I don't believe that it's a conflict of interest as long as I recuse myself from discussions that would affect me. That is the law. That is what I have always attempted to do. And that is what I will continue to do. Anytime that there is a vote, that would affect me directly or my business directly, I recuse myself. And I, and I do operate restaurants in town here. And that is my business. It's been my business for over 10 years. And so I can't give up my business and my livelihood, actually, in order to uh, be a member of this council un unless uh, the city is willing to pay a whole lot more for council members um, in order to, to be full-time members of the council because this is a truly a part-time job and uh, I don't believe that if you recuse yourself that it is a conflict of interest, but you do have to follow the letter of the law and I try to do that. Trent? Um, I've been looking forward to this question for some time. Um, the reality is I do work in health care and have for the last 30 years. I look at it as a good thing to have the experience with the health care coming on the hospital board, but there is a concern and I recognize that. Um, anytime there would be a, a violation, I should say a violation, a conflict, um, I'd recuse myself and not vote on the topic. I don't have any problem doing that and um, that's the way I would handle it. Now, anyone else who would like to address this issue? Becky, I saw your hand first. <laughs> Yes, definitely. Um, I think that one of the issues that we have in council is that we have a perception, and I'm going to say it's a perception, that there is a lot of conflict of interest. Um, probably more so because so many of the council, current council, are business people. Um, I think we need to be able to separate the, the business portion of it and be logical and actually look at what your business is and how that affects what you're voting for. Um, I think we have, I'm going to, I, as a, can I, yeah, I'm going to finish. Thank you. I, I plan on representing my ward as a special interest. Hopefully that won't create conflict. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, Joe, let's well, during one session when we were doing liquor license, I raised some issues about the conflict of interest. Uh, I quoted from Supreme Court opinions relative to what creates a conflict of interest. I also alluded to another um, court case uh, that addressed that issue. Conflict of interest, basically, if you are in a public position uh, and you receive a personal gain or you receive favors uh, that the ordinary citizens don't receive, that generally goes to a conflict. And I'm a former 
business owner in this city, but still own property. Okay, Joe Shumway, I saw your hand up. I feel like it's a football game. Thank you, Judy. I, uh, <clears throat> I do want to make a comment about this. I want the public to know that in every agenda that our mayor brings to us at the beginning of every city council meeting, he asks if there's any conflicts on anyone on the council so we can declare that. Then our attorney, our city attorney, rules on that. We have also asked to have rulings from the attorney general from the Wyoming Liquor Commission and from our city clerk, anyone that we can get rulings on this, I have never moved forward on any issue until we've made sure that all conflicts have been declared and, and decided whether there is or is not a conflict. As far as I know, this council has never had a conflict of interest that's gone forward. Anyone else? Who, yes, Paul? I'm really glad this question has been asked. I have uh, served on a state board and the guidelines are, are clear for state boards. The governor's uh, current guidelines for state boards, um, I learned recently, actually encourages an abstention or recusal even in the case of the appearance of impropriety. And I think that's a good high quality standard that we should all strive to live up to. Um, the Planning Commission and I have um, not been shy about removing myself from a vote when I perceived a conflict of interest or of interest or even the appearance of it. And I think that's a good standard to adhere to because if you don't adhere to a standard that, of that high quality, you cannot not engender mistrust as a public official. ...meeting which may have a public comment period allotted to it. Now I do have one question I'll combine with this, which seems to be a bit of complaint about city council saying, why not have public comments at the beginning of the meeting instead of at the end? But I would, I don't know how the hospital board uh, conducts itself in this regard, but this is appropriate for everyone. And I'm going to begin with Rex down at the end so he doesn't get left off. Oh, I don't feel left out at all. Um, I personally don't have any problem with people contacting me outside of uh, regular meeting hours. I mean, I'm a university teacher, and believe me, I get questions all day and all night sometimes. Uh, preferably not by phone call, usually by email or things like that. And I don't seem to have a significant issue with that unless it's somehow prohibited by the rules of the board, which again, I'm not aware that that's the case. Um, and I, I'm sure that the board meetings are you know, open to the public and there is a public comment period and uh, I think it's, I think it's better to have it at the end, frankly, so you know what the issues are. Okay, Tom, we'll just keep going forward. Yeah, okay, uh, this if I get on the, the hospital board, it's it's not my first rodeo, and the city council is probably worse than any of the other boards or commissions in the city of Laramie, where people think that they have a right to your time. Uh, I really don't mind that so much. I, I ran a business where I was available all the time to all kinds of people. And I would spend probably a good hour and a half almost every day of the week talking to people who wanted to talk about this or that, dealing with city council kinds of things. And I had no problem with it because if you are elected to represent the people, that's where the rubber hits the road. Who else are you going to talk to but your elected officials? Unless you voted and feel you have a right to bitch and you just bitch anywhere you want to to anybody you want to. So I don't have any problem with that and I, the hospital does a good job of taking comments from the public. But I do draw the line when people think that they have a perfect right because you're a public person to do the same thing with your family. And that does happen from time to time and people need to, to realize that uh, families are off limits. Uh, personally, I don't have any problem on the boards that I've served on previously and, and currently serve on. I encourage people. I think that's part of the public service that's involved and via email, phone, whatever. I uh, encourage people to contact me. I'm going to use the term the rubber beats the road. Um, if people can't contact you, you can't respond to them in a polite, professional manner, um, then you probably shouldn't be a city council person. Um, 
I think there are issues with agenda construction at the council. Also, and, and let's not get into that to a point of distraction, that the agenda can be modified. Um, it has been my experience in the last eight months that that is not something that um, this council prefers to do. That doesn't mean that it can't happen in the future. Um, secondly, and probably finally, public hearings are the most important component of any kind of, of statutory process. We have to figure out a better way to communicate with our citizenry so they know when to comment. Um, I think they're out there and the comments are out there, but we're not, I don't think we're getting them to the council, nor can the council actually use those comments in a constructive way for their decisions. I don't see a problem. I think part of our job is public contact. I spend 30 to 35 hours a week not only reading all the materials, but talking to people, either on the phone or in person. I prefer to meet them and sit down in person and talk to them. I will not discuss anything that is related to personnel. There's a proper due process or any of that that starts with the city manager and then she'll take that through its proper course. If there's a program, if there's uh, an agenda item, uh, if there's a development, uh, anything, uh, water rates, uh, I'm getting a lot of calls now about the disruption of service with Optimum and um, uh, Bresnan and the city attorney is looking at the franchise agreement see if we can get things worked out for people. Uh, over a year ago, I, I brought up to the council to move the public comment section to the front of the agenda, and it wasn't a favorable thing to do, and it was voted down. I think the public has a right. We are voted in by the public. We represent the interest of the public, and that's what we are. We are public servants, not self-serving. So. <coughs> I get it. All right. I would if I were you. How how else how else can you find wisdom if you don't look to the place you're at and the people you're sharing it with? How else do you learn? I find no problems with interacting with the folks I spend my time with. Um, I'm I'm not worried about a city council stalker. I'm I'm a big guy and I can take care of myself. That's all I have to say about that. I always enjoy uh, talking with people about the, the various topics that we get to discuss at, at council. It's generally more enjoyable to talk to the public than it is at the council meeting. So I actually kind of relish uh, the, the, the idea of public contact outside of council chambers. It's, it's often more entertaining. Uh, there is some difficulties with the format of our, our system, and, and some of it derives from state statute. And, and some of it derives from what council has done in the past. And so uh, there are ways that we can modify it, but the difficulty with the council meetings is that we don't provide a good, solid uh, opportunity for public input before we vote on things, uh, the, way that, the way that I think it could happen. But I don't know if with, with, with the state statutes in Wyoming, the way they work for the business meetings, which is typically what the council meetings are, that we could make it work properly to make everybody satisfied anyway. So uh, we're looking at it. The council is looking at opportunities to, to modify our structure, but there there is no guarantee that we can get around all of the state statutes because of uh, how they're written. Thank you. I think uh, you know, public comment and public information where public officials, of course, I'll just say that my phone number is uh, 7420393 and my email address is uh, pierce or pierce.j at gmail.com. So call me, email me, let me know what you're thinking. It's been my experience that before each uh, <clears throat> council meeting or work session, we typically 
as council members will receive somewhere between 20 to 100 uh, comments, either face-to-face, -face, email, phone calls, uh, or texting. We even get Twitter every now and then. But, uh, you know, I think everyone on the council appreciates that contact because it, it helps us to get a feel for what, you know, what everyone is, is thinking about. There's a lot of great ideas that come from this. Now, the city council uh, has typically on their agenda, which is a business meeting, it's the council business, 20 to 30 items each, each time we meet. And what you'll notice if you watch this on TV, there's always a public comment on each of the items. Where the mayor always says, now we're going to go to comments from the public. And then we also have a, a, a portion of the meeting that's been set aside, and I've served on different councils. Sometimes it's at the beginning. Right now it's at the end, but we always have that time set aside so that they can have things that are non-agenda items to make comments on. And they can be buried and they can be, you know, things that are unexpected or things that really are hot topics for the city to be considering. So again, I think we all appreciate receiving this input for our for you know each of us to have better knowledge of what's going on in the city. Well, I think as if you're on the city council, you are a public servant, and uh, your boss is, is every resident in your ward, and I think your responsibility is even broader than that to every resident of this community. And so I'm a guy who's never going to um, be talking to a constituent and then look at my watch as if there's not enough time. I'm never going to be a guy whose phone number's not in the phone book. I want to be accessible to people. I want to be able to have that kind of dialogue with people. A lot of the best ideas that I have been able to bring forward and move into policy with the city actually came from input from the public. And it's from talking to people out here in the local community that, uh, that a city council person can actually find out what people are concerned about, what are the issues that need to get addressed, what are the problems that need to be fixed. And the more public input there is, the better the decision-making process and the better the outcome for the city. And I think uh, Councillor Shumway pointed out something very important, which is that every single agenda item has a public comment period. And every time there is not a member of the public that stands up and gives a viewpoint during that period, the city council is the poorer because we are not as informed as we could be. Um, I think it's very important when listening to the public to make sure that we're not just listening to one narrow slice of the public, but listening to everybody regardless of what their position are or what their position is. And so that's that's been a hallmark of, of how I've done my business with the council. Well, I can't say it any better than uh, the other candidates have said, especially Joe and Eric. And I would also be available to anyone who wanted to talk to me about agenda topics or anything else that they're concerned about within the city. And that's all. I have social media already set up, Twitter, Facebook, email, phone numbers, they're all out there. They're very public for people to get a hold of me. I have knocked on pushing a thousand doors. I'm out there in the public trying to talk to the people because if you're not accessible to the people, what are you sitting on a city council board for? So you have to be accessible to the people outside of the meetings because the meetings are once a week, last for three, four hours. and if you do not get to everything, if people do not have time to ask their questions, they need to have some way to get a hold of somebody to get some of their answers. They get more answers one-on-one -on -one than they can in a public forum a lot of times because they are they are one-on-one -on -one and they can have the person look them in the eye and tell them what they think or anything like that. So yes, they do. I do think it is good to have people contact you outside of a city council meeting. Oh. We're a little tangled. <laughs> I, I think you've heard um, a number of the candidates say this, but if, if you're not interested in talking to members of the public outside of the official meetings, you don't have any business serving a public office or seeking it. I think you have to be open and uh, willing to do that. I. Uh, certainly agree with uh, the comments to that effect. I do think, though, that there are some opportunities for um, the uh, City Council to improve the quality of uh, its constituent service. 
and the ability of citizens to give detailed input on issues. I think that uh, the format limitations of the business meetings are difficult. Uh, they're difficult for citizens, and I think they're difficult for members of the council. You know, I'm not sure what the statutory guidelines are surrounding that, but I think if we could increase the number of town hall meetings, uh, town hall meeting style format, um, gatherings that we have, especially when we have major issues that are coming up that people have strong opinions about that we're more focused on listening to those opinions prior to the business meeting, that would be very, very helpful. I think there are areas where we could increase uh, the quality of constituent service, office hours for city council members, uh, things like that that were open to the public. I think that would help. I would definitely support that. I would like to see more of that happening. I think Wyoming has a pretty strong tradition of open access to elected officials, and that should be even more so at uh, the level of city council and uh, government offices at the local level. So I think there's room for improvement that we need to see happen. Thanks. Okay, you've heard everyone speak on this issue. Now I'm going to take it a little bit further to something specific that two people asked, and I'm going to begin with Ward 2, City Council, because you haven't had a chance to start. And it is a question about, okay, how come you're not paying attention to the recommendations of your own advisory committees? And for those of you who aren't incumbents, I will say that one of the questions had to do with the recommendations, uh, a particular recommendation of the Planning Commission. I do not know specifically which recommendation the questioner had in mind, but I suspect it was the Indian, wait a minute, what is it? No, not Sir Sky. I think it is. Point. Indian Ridge or Indian Point, Point uh, subdivision on the the north east side of Laramie. Does that sound logical? Or if you want to take it as a serious guy, I didn't know that there was a recommendation from anyone not to do that. But uh, Bill, would you like to begin with that? Do you have a microphone handy? Jane, if you would give him one, that would be nice. All right. Um, from what I understand, the, the issue that I believe is at hand isn't dead, from what I understand. Um, when I see the, the planning commission and the city council, is it, the difference is being structural. In the end, you have to work together to get it done. Um, I think it possibly could have been handled differently, um, so there'd be less hurt feelings. But I mean, in the end, it's, it's coming to terms with the, the bodies that have the power to make it happen. I don't see it as much of a slide on the planning commission as it was just a hold of horses, let's think about this a bit. Um, on the other hand, I can see the other point of view where it's like, man, we went through all this trouble, all this work, we've done all this, and this is what we're at. Are you, are you just slapping us in the face with this? Um, I don't see it. That's not my perception of it. I see it as we have two entities working together to, to come to the conclusion. I would, I've got hurt feelings and hostility, I'd tone down and just try to work together to get it resolved. When you, when you look at the, uh, the different activities of the Planning Commission and the Council, the, the difficulty uh, is, is twofold. First off, the Planning Commission makes a rest recommendation to the council members. They are appointed by the council. The, the, planning, the planning Commission members are appointed by the council. Um, on the case of the council, we're elected by the public at large. And so we, we have a political agenda. They have actually a priority agenda that says, we will do this by the book, by the law. When the, Planning Commission brings something to the council. The way I look at it is, does it meet the letter of the law? Does it meet the standard and guidelines that are laid out in our governances? And are this uh, are these things that this body is recommending to the council within the bounds of the law? If they are, I support that. In the case of Indian Ridge, I voted against it. Um, I, I felt that the Planning Commission was correct and that their, their findings of fact and conclusions of law were right. Um, 
when you look at other things. I don't think that I've overturned a planning commission yet, but some on the body have. And at those times, they have reasonings that are beyond mine, obviously. And I always strive to uphold what they're doing with the planning commission, as long as they're finding uh, fact and, and conclusions of law are, are within the bounds that they need to be, because they are the ones that recommend to the council what we decide. Thank you. Can I, can I just ask a question back? Sure. Would that be right? I'll just put it back to you. Um, basically, what, you know, given that there is this conflict, how do, how, do, how, do we, how do you resolve it? I mean, can you further define the question for me? I Jane? mean, if, if people, if people are, are concerned that they're working really hard on the planning com commission or whatever it happens to be, and they put in all this effort, and then they bring it to the council and, and all their hard work is basically thrown out the window, how, how do you make, how do you not have that happen? How do you make it work? Well, the difficulty is that they are, they are appointed by the council. And so the council says to these individuals, would you be willing to do this? And so if they are willing to do that, they have to understand that even if they feel that their conclusions of, of fact and, and findings within the law are correct, the council as an elected body still has the right to overturn that under law. We, we as elected officials have to represent the constituents. That's what it comes down to. If we feel it's better for the city of Laramie to go against the planning commission, then that's what the council should do. But I haven't done that yet. Okay, Jane, essentially you forfeited your time. I did. That's fine. Joe? Thank you. This, this obviously is a very important question because we're talking about over 17 acres of land that's being proposed to be developed at about 30th and Garfield. It's called the point. And the recommendation that came to the to the council from the planning commission was was a positive negative or negative positive. It was, it was something our city attorney said, this is not clear, this is not something that is ready for you to take a vote on. He asked us to remand it back to the planning commission, which we did, and they're working on that now. We plan on uh, working on that in, on the 17th of this month. I think it's important for us as a city council to always have a good relationship with the planning commission and it's been my experience that we do. In fact, our mayor, Scott Muller, came from the Planning Commission. Uh, also, we have two or three others I can I think of, Dave Malikas and others, that have come to us from the Planning Commission because that is one of the key uh, responsibilities that we have in, in committees that, that come to us. I, I heard from my twin brother, who was a mayor for 17 years, in a small town in Utah said, I don't know why I'm on the city council. He was the mayor. He says, if I really want to make an impact in this city, I'll be on the, on the board of planning and zoning. So it's very important. It's also important for us to have a good relationship because there's so many important things that come from them to us for us to make the final decision on. Well, you know, I think that the, uh, the Planning Commission in particular has an important role to play in as far as uh, it's there to raise red flags. It's a board that's made up of citizens, so it really represents uh, some citizens' concerns. And when the, the Planning Commission uh, makes a recommendation not to approve something, I think it's the responsibility of the council to find out why they recommended not to approve it, what the problems are, and to fix that problem or problems or not to approve it. And, uh, you know, honestly, with the, uh, the Indian Ridge subdivision, when it came forward with a negative recommendation from the Planning Commission, uh, it had problems. And uh, I fought very hard to get, that, uh, get those problems addressed, and uh, I was in the, in the minority. So I would ask the public, if they are upset with that, bring me some more help so that next time there will be five votes to fix it. I think uh, in terms of the, the point, I think that's a very similar situation. I think that uh, the idea that that uh, this was sent back to the Planning Commission because it didn't have findings and fact and conclusions of law. It was political gamesmanship on the part of our attorney, and I didn't appreciate that. And so I was very feisty about that. And uh, the city attorney was very upset with me for getting in his face about that. But honestly, you know, if staff is going to go against the will of the people and you know, take a policy position, then I'm not going to stand for that. Um, I serve on the Planning Commission, and so this is a uh, subject that's my heart, and I don't, the camera, <laughs> that was 
you more time. It's okay. No, I need to keep going. So the thing is, is that the planning commission, a lot of times the public shows up at our meetings and Eric is our liaison with the council, he, so he's aware too. We get a lot of public input at those planning commission meetings where people feel strongly about a subject. So when we take a recommendation, and we are only there to advise the city council, you know, and as you know. So when we take a recommendation to the city council, it usually has some a lot of public input behind it. So and and I understand that sometimes our recommendations aren't followed, that's okay. But yeah, that's all. City Council appoints the Planning Commission, so you think they want to work together really well. So that's it. They need to work together, but the City Council does need to make sure that things are followed to the letter of the law, because that's basically what their job is. So let's, City Council, I don't know what to say on this. I know what I want to say. I don't know how to take from here to here. Um, city Council just needs to listen to the Planning Commission, Planning Commission needs to listen to the City Council. They just both need to work a lot tighter together to get things approved or if they find flaws in it to shoot them down. That's all I got to say on that one. Well. Thank you. I also currently serve on the Planning and Zoning Commission. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. I think it's one that probably people wonder about when they read about how the um, how the meetings go and the disagreements between the commission and the council reported in the paper. The fact is, is that uh, planning and zoning is often, not always, but often and usually just one layer in the process of uh, the decision making. And that's the reality. So if, uh, if our decision isn't uh, accepted or deemed uh, to the letter of the law, the city council certainly has the ability to go forward with their own, uh, their own uh, views on it. Uh, the Grove Complex, which unfortunately, uh, Mr. Mayor, that was one area where you did disagree with the council, i got to remind you, or with the commission, I do have to remind you, the Grove Complex up there by uh, the Grease Monkey. Did I? Yes, okay, you did, did I sir. Correct it? Yeah, um, but that's all right, and I don't think anyone on the commission takes it personally. I heard there's some comments to that effect. It's, it's understood that we are one layer in the decision-making process, uh, but the Grove, the uh, point and uh, some of these other developments, um, the Indian Ridge, these are all recent decisions or decisions that are in the process of being made where there has been some disagreement. But I want to say that as a member of the Planning Commission, despite being appointed to that board by the council, I do see my role there as ultimately responsible to the public uh, first. And I feel like that's the right perspective. Maybe that isn't always the right perspective, but for me, listening to what the public input is and then using that to make my decision is what I think I should be doing as a member of the Planning and Zoning Board. And that's uh, generally how I approach it. Thank you. Now we'll go to Board 3. Becky? Well, um, what can I say? Um, first of all, I'm going to address Indian Ridge, and hopefully I can do this quickly. I think Joe and I both deserve four minutes on this one. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to say that uh, City Council overrule Indian Ridge 5-4. At that point, uh, the community as a whole, uh, that basically, the reason why I'm running for council is because of how we were treated that night. So we'll leave that as a, as a side note, but I will say that we need to understand too that the Community Development Office, the CDD, did a job that was remarkable and took a lot of our recommendations and a lot of our concerns into consideration so that there are some caveats to that development that um, hopefully will continue to stay on top of. Um, the Grove right now is a nightmare um, for traffic at 30th and uh, Willett. It's a nightmare at 30th and Grand, and let's talk about the nightmare at 30th and Harding. Um, and I'm going to stop there because I only have 30 seconds. The point at this 
particular juncture, and these are all in Ward 3 because a lot of the development property is in this ward at this particular time. The point um, is right now um, just, it needs to be re-looked at, period. Um, there are not, they did not take into consideration uh, the community surrounding this proposed development. Thank you. Well, when it comes to the Planning Commission, you know, they are uh, citizens serving at will for us. Uh, they do volunteer their time. They are a recommending body, as I think, except for a couple of situations where their decision is final and then the only recourse is to go to a district court. In evaluating these projects, uh, the Grove, the Point, Indian Ridge, um, I and Councilman Lovar and Councilman Moner sat down with all the developers and, and the team from the Grove. We went over all the requirements for the comprehend, uh, not only the comprehensive plan, but the aquifer protection plan. We knew in the future there's going to have to be some roads put in. There's a temporary emergency road put in. Um, but as that thing grows, there'll be um, uh, that situation will take care of itself. I drive 30th Street from Reynolds to Grand Avenue every day, sometimes two or three times a day. I have not, the only time I've had a problem when the lights were out. Um, when it comes to the Indian Ridge, I know uh, I had the list of all the concerns people had there. I sat down with the, the proposers and the engineers. I went over every one of the concerns. I looked at property rights. I looked at the zoning. And I looked at the Unified Development Code. And I took the concerns of the citizens serious. They were able to address every one of these concerns, meet or exceed the expectation on that. I then took it to a contractor. And I, he didn't know I had just talked to the engineers and had those things concerned. Then I took it to another independent engineer friend that didn't know I talked to either one of the other two and showed the plans and said, are these issues being addressed or how should they be addressed? And when I look at a project, I want to line up to make sure that the people on both sides of the issue are treated equally. If there is an imbalance, then I would send it back or I would find out how we can correct that imbalance. So. Okay, thank you. Well, I guess I don't have a microphone. <laughs> thank you. I have a question for the hospital board candidates, and I guess we'll begin with Tom because you're the only one who hasn't started first in a question for them. And this has to do with medicine bow technology. If, and I hope you know what this is because I don't, but Medicine Bow Technology has been a drain on the hospital's resources for years. When will we divest it? Question. Tom? It's my understanding that Medicine Bow Technology uh, started when the city of Laramie got really hot to do something about bringing technical types of businesses to town and there was a real need at the hospital for uh, IT services and uh, uh, things like computerized charting, uh, processes that the, the computer age was forcing on the hospital. And uh, I don't know exactly how uh, it was set up with the hospital at that time. I guess it's kind of a satellite corporation of the hospital. They have their own board and those kinds of things. Uh, but being a startup company, uh, it takes time to build a clientele and sell you product. Uh, I'm sure the hospital's getting everything they wanted out of them, but uh, I think they're trying to, to grow the business into other hospitals. So uh, I, I, I guess I would be willing to cut them some slack for a while uh, and let them grow. Trent? Um, actually, we use Medicine Bow and have for several years as a backup device for our facility. Um, I know other facilities around the state. Um, and Trent, are you talking about Ivinson Hospital? Uh, Ivinson, no. Uh, where I work personally, we use them. 
um, as a backup device in case of disaster. Um, that's how I became familiar with it. Since then, they've grown to allow or um, have other hospitals such as, um, I believe they have uh, Green River, Rock Springs, and some other hospitals online now. That being said, they need to hold their own. And um, I would hope that the businesses they have on board now would be enough to keep them afloat and they are able to hold their own. Rex? Well, I sort of have to agree with, with both uh, Trent and Tom in the sense that I think they need to prove themselves to be able to show that they are providing value to the hospital or they need to go independent and be able to develop their own uh, client base without depending on the hosp hospital as a uh, affiliate or parent organization. Um, I do think that's really important and technology is my background to be able to support the technology wherever it needs, you know, wherever it's going with the um, increased dependence on electronic health records and other technology like that. Somebody's got to be there to do the work and you can't depend on um, the people in the hospital, the nurses and the doctors and the staff to do it. So somebody's got to support it. So my response really is, um, yeah, let's investigate. Let's look where they are and see whether they are providing a service that is essential to the hospital and supports the hospital or whether or not they need to go independent. I can't answer it definitively at this point. I need to study it some more, but I do know this in pretty good detail in terms of what the bases are, and I'd be happy to help the hospital work on that. Okay, I have another set of questions, and um, this could be close to being the la last one. We'll see how long-winded you all are on this one, but it is a question about the Casper Aquifer, and we're going to begin with you, Eric, because I think you have not begun a question yet, and you're in Ward 1. The question is, and it's from two different people, I'm going to put them together. Do you believe there's enough information to justify restrictions on the Casper Aquifer, and has the aquifer protection already been compromised by the Grove development, and can you explain uh, anything more about the Grove? Well, I think that's a great question. And you know, the city has been studying the Casper Aquifer since the 1990s. There have been two different sets of, uh, of aquifer protection ordinances that have gone through in this city. And we had a, a consultant from out of state, an independent consultant, come in and, and examine that in great detail. And we also have the benefit in this town of having a number of hydrologists locally that have had input on this as well. And so there has been a great deal of scrutiny on the aquifer. There has been data that has been gathered over the past 30 years. There have been six instances. Uh, there, there have been annual, um, there have been annual monitoring of nitrate, which is an important waste product that comes uh, out of septic systems and also out of uh, fertilizers and other sources. And uh, nitrate monitoring has shown that six times out of the last 30, when we've been monitoring, uh, that we are in the impacted level. So it's not natural levels of nitrate. So I think what that means is that we have to take a very careful look at what we allow to happen over the aquifer. At the same time, we have to honor the property rights of those people that are living above the aquifer. So I think we need to find a solution that protects those property rights, that doesn't push people out of their homes, that doesn't shut down people's septic systems, but that allows them to, uh, to continue. And yet, it's common sense that we don't want to put more septic systems over our aquifer because those are designed to pump human waste into the ground. Now, in terms of the grove, uh, that the grove actually uh, does have some issues with runoff. It has some very large parking lots with, uh, you know, the, the cars drip different chemicals out of those parking lots, and the grove is very close to uh, Spring Creek. And I have some serious concerns that we have not adequately um, managed the the, uh, the stormwater waste that comes off of that, uh, and that it may become an issue sometime in the future that may need additional attention. I also believe that we have a lot of, we've done a lot of studies on the Casper Aquifer by the higher groups as well as people in this town who have a lot of knowledge and 
so I, it's, it's important that we protect the aquifer. Um, as far as the grove compromising it, I'm not sure about that, but that, I think that is one of the reasons that I voted against the grove when I was on the planning commission. And it is the reason that I voted against the grease monkey, which also is uh, right there dripping. I mean, it doesn't drip, but in case of, an, of a storm, it could cause some harm to the Spring Creek Channel. So I do believe that that needs to be protected, and but that people's private property rights also need to be respected. Surely we can come to a compromise, maybe with a park system. <laughs> I do not believe there's enough scientific data for the aquifer. Um, I was, was actually talking to an expert in the field today who said it needs to be monitored at least once a quarter, so that's four times a year. And he says there's not monitoring wells in place on the aquifer to do that. So how can we have good, solid numbers of what's in there if there's not monitoring wells in place. He also said that there should have been monitoring wells put in like 15 years ago that were never put in. So I question why were they not put in? So until we get the data that everybody can see monitoring once a quarter, not once a year, or and at this source, I do not believe we have enough scientific data. Thanks. Looks like God. Uh, audience saved the, the really tough question for the end here. This has been one of our divisive issues in Laramie, how are we are going to deal with this aquifer situation. Um, to answer the question, I'm inclined to think that more research would be better and would allow for a more definitive answer. But saying that, I, I'm not ignoring the fact that a significant amount of research has already been put in to try and um, help direct policy for this question. but. There is still some debate depending on who you talk to. There are several qualified geologists and hydrologists that don't necessarily agree about what, um, what we can tell from the data we have, whether or not we've been monitoring it long enough to identify clear trend lines. The research that's been done recently does seem to indicate that we're having increased nitrate pollution from increased development. And that's something that the city and the community should be concerned about, and they are. We, it's, it's not going away in the discussion. There's still some question out there as to whether or not we can say and infer from the data and the research that's been done um, that we can justify uh, increasing regulation or an expansion of the, of the city's um, authority to do that. Ultimately, though, what matters is that we need to come up with solutions, and uh, in this case, a solution that will protect private property rights and the public safety. I mean, that's the outcome that we need. Now, um, if we can do that by purchasing the land and developing that into a green space in a park area, that's great. But I don't think we should be putting our eggs in one basket as a community. We need to look at all of the options that would be available to try to solve both aspects of that problem. Thank you. Let's go to Joe. Can you sure. take that next? I, I also appreciate having this question come because it's such a, a, a serious and a, and a very important question for all of us in the city and you know, especially the planning commission and city council to deal with because we have a great responsibility to protect this valuable, valuable resource which is the water that comes from the Casper Aquifer. Now, concerning this specific question about the grove, uh, the grove as far as we know, has not had any any serious anything that has indicated that they have, they have compromised the Casper Aquifer. When they brought their plan to us, they brought it with with uh, they went beyond the requirements which the city required them to protect Spring Creek and other things by having a higher standard for for their development than what was required. Now. As far as, as far as where they are situated, I would have never supported anything that was over the Casper Aquifer zone or the overlay, which we had determined. And so what happened is when they, when they came forward with their plan for residential uh, units, this was something that the council went over and over and over because it's such a, a serious thing to do. Uh, but what was happening right now is we study this general area 
30% of one area that we looked at had serious problems with elevated nitrates. And that's something that we have to be very keen and aware of and always make the right decision for the community to protect the aquifer. Okay. Sure, I'll just keep going with that. Um, after our last uh, get together, I tried doing some research on nitrates, and, and obviously I'm not a chemist, so um, it was a little involved and, and deep. But the bottom line is, at least what I learned, or at least what I think I know right now, um, is those levels fluctuate, and there's there's different science and different times and. and it just changes. So I guess the bottom line is we always need to continue research in that area, and we need to continually monitor and continually, you know, take care of our take care of our water. Um, in terms of private property rights, obviously we need to respect respect that as well. But we also need to take a big look at the greater good, and obviously we all need good, clean drinking water. So. As, as we look at the aquifer and, and then at the Grove, um, you know, the city has been dealing with this issue for several decades. Uh, they, they've been worried about water for uh, since since the 80s when they bought the Monolith Ranch to to buy water rights, priority water rights. The city of Laramie is a, is a city that has limited water supplies. We have some water to the east of us from the aquifer. We have some water in the river that we've, we've uh, gotten now, but we still are very limited in our water supply. And the consultant studies and everything, they've shown that at times we have some increased nitrate levels in, in some of the wells. But we really we really don't have a smoking gun. We don't know where those nitrate levels are, what's causing them, where they're from. Um, and the city council has funded a large number of test wells to be drilled this next year. And there will be about a, a 10 of them, I believe, nine or 10. And once we have those, we will have a better ability to get information. But if we ever find the smoking gun, it's too late. That's the difficulty. So I hope we never do find the smoking gun. Uh, going to the Grove, when they built that, they built between a half a million and a million dollars worth of water protection uh, structures into the system. Filtration off of the parking lots, retention, on-site, in tanks, all kinds of different things. And so that's why I did support that one. There is enough evidence to my satisfaction to warrant taking serious consideration to protecting the Casper Aquifer. There is enough evidence to me, I think it is vital. Heaven forbid we protect the one thing vital to life here to our, for our community. Um, that said, um, there's a customer of ours whose septic system blew out over there, you know. So I think he may be the one that was responsible for the raise in the nitrates level, you know, when that thing went. That was a disaster. Oh my God, the good news is, though, is that he fixed it, and there's an updated septic system in there, and it's all right. And I do not want to throw my friends and neighbors and throw them under the bus while we're dealing with protecting our water. When I was a kid, now my best friend in preschool was out there in Sherman Hills. Um, I am very much in favor of limiting any future development over our water supply. I'm clear on that. As far as how we deal with the people that are already there, I'm in favor of us coming together as a community to help share the costs of addressing this issue. We need to address this together. Thank you. Well, the Grove, I, I think uh, three of us on council here, Council Mowar, Council Muller and I, we personally sat down with the developers of the Grove, went over the, our concern was the Casper Aquifer, listed all the requirements. They had no problem meeting or exceeding the requirements. And they adjusted their development to do that before they brought that to council. And I think that Grove is a perfect example that the right type of development under the right conditions can be accomplished on the aquifer, okay? The main threat to the aquifer is the I-80 corridor, Telephone Canyon. If you read the Casper Aquifer Plan, it's pretty thick, it addresses every issue, including septic systems, 
how to monitor them, how to maintain them, and all the other issues that get hammered night and day, the solutions are in that plan if we just follow it. The best protectors of the aquifer are the people that live on it. Their day-to-day -day life depends on their septic system working properly and their wells working properly. If we have a plug drain, we can call a plumber for 65 bucks an hour, 70 bucks an hour, have it unplugged in an hour. You can't fix a septic system for 65 bucks. Also, we have a program and it's funded. Um, and matter of fact, the I-80, the first phase, uh, has been bid out by the county and the bid should be let. And that first phase for protection should be instituted pretty shortly. So. Well, the Casper Aquifer is a very interesting topic. Um, you pit <clears throat> private property rights, you pit density issues, you pit um, special interests, and I'm going to address that specifically. Um, in a portion of Indian Ridge, um, there was a piece of that property that was exempt from the Casper Aquifer Plan, and the sitting council um, agreed to that. So let's start there. Um, the people in Sherman Hills, uh, if I understand this correctly, are actually monitoring their wells twice as much as most um, municipalities require. Um, it's a broad, broad issue. I believe that we should protect the aquifer until we figure out what's going on. Um, the science is all over the place. And Joe referred to the aquifer plan. I have to admit to you, I have not read it because in essence, I can't find it in small enough doses to at least pull it off my computer. So again, let's talk about the communication issue on the Casper aquifer. Would anyone on the hospital board like to comment on the aquifer? Okay. I'm not seeing uh, a whole lot here. Let's see. Um, I'm going to give you all 30 seconds, Joe Carroll, got that? For a very interesting philosophical question for all of you, and that is what is your vision for Laramie's growth, and how does it impact your vision, impact the office that you're running for? And we'll begin with, who should we begin with? Joe Vitale. I think we haven't begun with you yet, have we? <laughs> what did Only you one have? microphone, Joe. Please. I have two eyes, I have two visions. <laughs> well, you know, I, I come to Laramie in 1959, and the university. I played against high schools in Michigan that were bigger than the university. Um, the building I own on Grand Avenue that used to be the restaurant was the last building going east. You got the tumbleweed and uh, you could put 50 cents in there at midnight and pump gas. That was, you know, it was pretty good. Um, everything, I live up on W Hill. That area from Harney Street, 15th Street East and Harney Street, north was nothing but open fields, prairie land, okay? And <laughs> Laramie, you're in trouble. I don't know if you can go in 30 seconds. My vision is growth with moderation and community input. That is the most important component. And Ward 3 is in the east area, and that is the area that is going to be most impacted, I believe, in the next 15 years. Um, and we have to start looking at not only what we need on the economic realm, but we also have to look at community. Thank you. Trent? Switching gears a little bit to the hospital. Um, certainly the hospital's grown over the years. The quality has improved immensely. Um, moving forward, um, 
I can see that, or I would hope to see that um, people would remain in this community for their care um, and that the care would be allowed and provided at the hospital so that they don't have to go elsewhere. Um, on top of that, that they continue to bring in uh, quality physicians and continue to grow the facilities and the infrastructure so that we have a, a great, whoops, there goes the stop sign. We have a great facility to, to service our needs. I was born here, most of my family was born here, so uh, this is my home. Uh, there's nowhere else in the world I'm going to live. But you have to realize Laramie's unique. We're a high plains desert. We're, uh, there are certain things you cannot do at this altitude, and with the resources that we have, we're being pushed by the front range. Most of the things that have happened in the last 15 years or so have been pushed by the front range. I think we have to kind of look at ourselves a little bit like Boulder. We have to limit how big we're going to get, and instead of getting bigger, we need to get better. Next. Well, compared to Tom, I'm a relative newcomer. I've only been here 27 years. I didn't think I'd stay that long. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I, I think that it's really important for Laramie to find a way to provide more jobs for uh, its people, particularly our UW graduates, so they stay here. And I think providing adequate health care is really important in terms of being having people have a chance and to recruit people to come to Laramie. I just got back from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, where my wife's family lives, and you cannot believe there's almost a hospital or a care clinic on every corner. It's quite different. It's not that much bigger. We need to try to develop more more resources of that nature. Thanks. Um, since we're all doing this, I guess I'll let everyone know that I've lived in Laramie for 22 years. And I think that, um, you know, having, having been in the community for a long time isn't necessary, but it does help when you're uh, putting yourself forward as a candidate to represent uh, people in a public office. I think Laramie has a lot of potential, but my personal vision, frankly, isn't nearly as important to me as remaining committed to effectively representing the views and values and vision of the people that live here in Laramie that I'm supposed to be speaking for. And I think the way to do that is through better constituent service and being an active and engaged member of the city council. Okay, I'm really the newbie things. I've only been in Laramie four years. So, but I would love to see business growth and youth programs that are affordable for all. I would love to see a select scholarship program established in the city for youth programs to make sure that families can afford them. And with business growth, those youth that are in those youth programs will have jobs in the future. <laughs> well, my vision is a city where our graduates that graduate from our university can get professional jobs and stay here and live and have families and grow their families them here. And I'd like to see a safe city with amenities that serve all who live here, such as parks and trails and natural areas and good recreation for our youth and good paved roads for, for all and, um, of course, our satisfactory sewers and water mains. Very well put, Ms. Henry. You know, I think in Laramie, we need growth on our terms. And when I say growth on our terms, that means growth that reflects the values of the people that are in the community and not necessarily the profit-driven motives of the developers. I think we need bicycle-friendly and walking-friendly communities. I think we need a blossoming arts and culture. I think we need to look south into Colorado and see the sprawl that's happened in some of those communities that's happened from poorly planned growth and learn from that and have our growth happen in an infill manner. And finally, I think we need to recognize the individual strengths and individual character of our neighborhoods, which are very diverse, and make sure that that individual character and our small town charm is left here for not just our generation, but future ones. Joe? <laughs> Stretch over to this one. Um, I moved to Laramie in the 1970s and uh, have loved living here. As far as growth in Laramie, I want Laramie to have responsible growth and I want them to have smart growth. I want a Laramie that is safe 
for our families. I want a Laramie that promotes businesses, and I want a Laramie that, that is focused on education. We put all those together, and we have just exactly why I'm here, a great place for our, ourselves, our families, and for our community. Hey. I guess um, I've been in Laramie for uh, three years, but that doesn't mean I'm three years old. So, um, in terms of in terms of my vision for Laramie and, and our growth, I, I feel that our key is diversification. Obviously, we have the university here, but we need many, many, many other things to happen here. Um, University is a nonprofit, and we need to get some things where we can collect some revenue from. So, so that's it. Scott? Thank you. I've been here for uh, 23 years now, and, and when I graduated from UW, I came to go to graduate school, and, and I stayed to get my PhD as well. And, and when I graduated, there really weren't any jobs, so I made my own job. I, I opened a restaurant. And so I, I really don't work in my field, but what, what I've been told by others and what I've seen myself is that we need to come up with a way to retain our human capital. We, we generate over a thousand students every year from this university. Okay. <laughs> no, that's the, fine. the question was asked philosophically, so I'll answer it philosophically. I see growth here in this room. I see the future of Laramie here. Your future city council is up here somewhere, right? The future people who care about it are there. Um, deal with the resources you have available and you can build and grow. I, I've lived here my entire life, and I would love to have the opportunity for my daughters to grow up and spend time here too. Build with what you have. Deal with what's around. We cannot project our thoughts into the future. We can deal with what's here. Are we back where we started? Okay. 30 seconds is a lot faster. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <it does. laughs> yeah. Even though Joe Vitale would like uh, a few more, but no, 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 it's not to say I'm offering it. Um, we promised that there would be some minutes, at least 20 minutes at the end of this session for you all to talk one-on-one -on -one with the folks that are here. I want to call your attention to a couple of things that are on the back table in case you came late. One of them is a little thing that is called the Pocket Emergency Residential Guide for Laramie, which is a project of the League of Women Voters. It's a little thing here intended to be credit card size that you carry in your wallet. It tells you exactly what to do in the event of some kind of emergency, whether it be fire, flood, tornado, heaven forbid, earthquake, whatever. And they're in the little basket there on the left-hand side of the table. There are also yes, our, van, our very own Vanna White holding them up. We also have um, that pro con statements about the two ballot issues in Laramie. And I will tell you, candidates from city council, that I did not use the questions that were related to these because most of you answered them in the voter guide, which is on the back table, but folks are very interested in how you feel about them. Uh, there's also pro-con statements about the three uh, constitutional amendments to the Wyoming Constitution, which Amy is holding up, freebies for you to take. And remember what our county librarian has requested, and that is your assistance with the chairs. However, don't let that uh, stand in the way of buttonholing these folks here. You heard them say that they love to talk to you. So <laughs> put your money where your mouth is, folks, and <laughs> let's see something happen. Now, Amy, you have one more thing? Yes, this is the pro-con on the two ballot items concerning uh, local taxes. Right. Right. Okay. You mentioned that. Okay. Thank you all for coming and candidates. Thank you for being here. Let's give them a little hand. See what you what you need to get is a little more. You know, you, you
very kind and gentle.